Well, good Sabbath to everyone, those that are tuned in listening. The notes, uh, the outline for what I'm presenting was posted on the website uh, mid-morning at some point. So if anyone out there had looked earlier and missed it, it's, it's available. There's also a chart on the appointed times that I want to comment on as well. So we're getting ready for the big freeze here. And uh, I guess that kills the bugs, and we'll appreciate that next summer. Uh, this winter, it's a little different. Our, we have a snow thrower that's in fairly new. It's it's a few years old, but it's been running pretty good till this year. <laughs> and, and I couldn't get it started. So I checked the float, and the float's working, and I got some starter fluid, and I could run it off of the starter fluid once I found where the intake was, and then but it's not working. So if there's no fuel coming through the line or the needle into that bowl. So, you know, I think that's somebody's way of saying, Mark, you just need some exercise. <clears throat> In the summer, you mow the yard, you maintain the place, you walk the dog because it's nice. In the winter, you just kind of sit down. So I'm actually not going to have it serviced at this point. Not only that, if I did They'd hand it back to me in March because the line's got to be this long. But I don't think I'm going to get service. I think I'm just going to shovel snow this winter. And I think it'll probably do me a service to have an activity that I go back to. Used to. I remember one year we had we had banks on the side of our driveway as tall as I was. And uh, that was a heavy, heavy year. I hope that's not this year. I'm not as young as I was once. But anyway, I'm just... Decide I'm just going to shovel this year and see how that works. Appreciate that we've had some opportunity here locally. Uh, we have discussion on an ongoing basis in the hall, but during the week. And we're talking back and forth. And it gives an opportunity to kind of think about something, vet it a little bit, have somebody else make a contribution. Uh, you don't, Most of what I teach, somebody showed it to me. Most of what I teach, somebody said, well, look at this here, or here's something that I've understood. And I can see that, and all of a sudden the light goes on, and maybe you connect a few more dots. But a lot of it's come from discussion, interaction, people that have done their own studies, and it's, it's been very, very helpful to me conceptually. I was talking to Terry this morning. He... Uh, he went to Ambassador College in 1966, five, 65. So uh, that was, uh, you know, that's way back there. I got there in 73, okay? So he kind of forged the way. But he was telling me this morning, he was in second year Bible, and they were in second semester of second year Bible, and they were getting ready to study the book of Daniel and Revelation. And his instructor actually spent an entire original lecture explaining that they would be discussing the terms, the symbols, the meaning of those books, because our understanding was foundational or conceptual or toward the beginning of our understanding in some way. In other words, Jesus Christ had yet to speak from on high and tell, you know, his servant what the answer was and that nobody else would know it but him unless you heard him say so. I'm, I'm sorry, that's a little bit pejorative, but it's what was printed and taught and argued and demanded, okay? That's just reality. But Terry was actually there where they were still discussing the meaning of the book of Revelation and Daniel because they weren't absolutely sure that they had the answer, that this was something they needed to discuss. So you could actually have input on the discussion that would take place and eventually at least filter through into what the theology department itself was, was presenting. Well, isn't that an interesting concept? Now, as you get bigger, that's not easily done. So I understand just the natural process. But we have those discussions, and we vet back and forth in various ways, and we learn from each other. So what, what I'm trying to do today, if I can take my watch off, it's not actually a full study. It, 
hopefully I, I, I won't uh, run longer than maybe 30 minutes, but I want to address a few things for the sake of the discussion. I want to open that up. And I know that some people out there have made their time and energy in specific ways in the Bible, in their studies. And so I'm, I'm literally asking, if you've got something to say, contribute it. Now, if you send me a 100-page paper, or Terry, or Les, whoever it is, uh, I'll get to it someday. I've got 100-page paper on my inbox, and I've got other ones that are not quite as extensive as that. We're not talking on the internet, we're talking in my inbox. When you do that, when you send me a whole website, okay, you know, you just slowed down the wheels of my progress because now I have to wait until I can look through and consider. So I'll just, just what the reality is. But I will say this. At these days, the more I learn, the more I realize how little I understand. It, it goes the other way. And a, and a friend of mine actually said it this way. Well, you pick up one rock and there's more rocks underneath. Normally you pick up a rock and you can see the mud or the little creatures or something. You know what's under the rock. But in this case, you pick up the rock and there's more rocks. Well, instead of one, you got, now you got five rocks. So this is an interesting process. It is our individual responsibility to work with God's Spirit, utilizing whatever gifts are available to us, whether that be a, 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 a teacher as an assistant or a servant, or whether that be our own personal study or the tools that are available. I mean, we have things now available on the Internet that weren't available in the history of mankind. And we're talking at the, at the, at the, at a, in a heartbeat, bang. What is that? Where is it? What does it say? So I just, I just want to bring up the fact that we're learning. Uh, I have updated my appointed times chart. I have put draft two on it because the first one was draft. This got, I thought about, well, if you upgrade something, that would make it an updraft. Well, maybe that was a bad term, so I decided not to use updraft. Uh, hot air going up in the air or something. So I put draft two, but I, I, I want to just tell you a couple of things I've done. Send me comment if you don't agree. Now, don't just tear me to shreds, but if you got something you want to say, send it and let me consider it. So I have day of trumpets now instead of feast of trumpets because it's not a feast. It's like day of a atonement. But you know what? I got rid of the word atonement because the word atonement in the English means to forgive or be forgiven. And that's not what it is. So I actually changed it to day of coverings. Now, I know that's a terrible thing to do because it's all through our theology and our history and our mind and our memory and scripture. But I just couldn't not change that one because it is a sidetrack going in the wrong direction. So under trumpets, I have day of trumpets and memorial of trumpets, all right, based on scripture. And then conceptually, I'll just say, what I want to do today, I want to address a, some introductory material for sake of the discussion. I want to introduce a few things that support the concept of the three festivals a year. And then I want to go back now Boyd's number 14 on his Mystery of the Millennium series was his, was his concluding, concluding argument. And if you feed a healthy animal too rich of food for too long, they'll get colic. So I honestly decided I felt it would be better to leave it on the website. Let people choose to go feed, digest, study, absorb, because the conceptual change is dramatic. So I, with that time having passed, hopefully, with a chance for me to have studied again a little further, I want to then offer this in the beginning, and then we'll go to Boyd's number 14 after I'm done, which is, I think, 50-some minutes. So we might run a little over on this today because I have some things I want to say first. But I just, I just want to say that conceptually, what we're arguing now, and when I say we, I'm not speaking for the group. Each individual 
has their own understanding and convictions, whatever that might be. That's their choice. That's their responsibility. What we're arguing in terms of what we teach is that the Feast of Tabernacles portrays the period of time when God the Father tabernacles on the earth and then men have to choose if they're going to tabernacle with him. It includes the time of the resurrections of the nations of the earth, which is pre-millennial. Now, I understand. That's, that, all the way back to Terry sitting in class, they wouldn't have agreed. Okay, oh, They wouldn't have agreed. But you know what? I'm not sure that I agree with much of what came out since he was in class either. And we've had to walk through some of those things one by one. So I've updated my appointed times references accordingly. Uh, it's still a draft. My presentation today is a draft. The entire presentation is a draft. But at some point in time, I want to be able to do what Terry's instructor did in Ambassador College when he was in Bible class and say, here's where we are. These are some things we need to discuss because these aren't absolutely written in stone yet. When I got there, they were all written in stone. There wasn't anything that wasn't written in stone. And when he got there, they were still writing, chipping on the, on the, on the plates, I guess. Well, I want to have the option for that discussion. We learn more from participating than we do from observing, Right? If you're watching the sports team down in the field, you learn something. But if you're actually on the field in the game, you learn more. So when you have to prove it for yourself as compared to, okay, I believe that. Or, yeah, okay, I trust you. Don't take your trust for somebody before us and then transfer it to your trust for us. Don't do that. that that's the wrong lesson here. The trust is in our Father and His Christ. And... We simply are his servants, and we're fallible, obviously. So our teachings are not, this is the word. If I read scripture within the range of translation, transmission, okay, that's God's words. When we then teach scripture, our explanation of it, we hope is God's words, but it's also our words. And we just, we can't get where that doesn't happen or that doesn't exist. So, again, go over the chart, take a look at it. It's updated in various ways, and it's not finished. But I'd like, I don't know, sometime within this year, this next year, I'd like to solidify it enough to where, at least in a general agreement, this, this reads and makes sense. But let me read a little bit from our ability to grow in understanding. Proverbs 1. It says, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple. Or he's not talking about prophetic knowledge here. He's talking about how do you live this life? How do you treat each other, okay? How do you take on the mind of God, the Father, and Jesus Christ? Christ being our example, and live those things. <clears throat> to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion, a wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of Yehovah is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So it's the fear of God that gives us the perspective to look to his words and want to apply these things in our lives. First thing we need to learn is how do we live this life. But in the process, God preached the gospel. Christ came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. What was that? That was that salvation was being offered to mankind. But it was being offered in a particular way. So understanding how that message applies is I think an important part of our understanding. Proverbs 2. <clears throat> my son, if you receive my words, treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. If you cry out for discernment, lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver 
and search for her as hidden treasure, how bad do you want to understand? Do you cry out to God for his spirit working with your mind to understand his words? Seek her with, as you were searching for hidden treasure, because this is truly hidden treasure. Then you will understand the fear of Yehovah. Find the knowledge of God, for Yehovah gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom <clears throat> for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice, preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity and every good path. So the foundation is learning how to live this life, how to treat each other, how to live honorably, ethically, and pure. But... When Daniel was crying out to God to understand, he wasn't saying, help me learn about not stealing. He, he wanted to understand what God's words were and what they meant and what the implication was. And he cried out. And in that case, indeed, God did show him. So I want to look at Luke 13. Very simple basis here. Proverbs talked about learning from a proverb and... In the New Testament, it talks about learning from a parable. They're actually related in some respects. Parables aren't strictly hidden information. They are stories and illustrations and examples, and not all of it is hidden where you have to go ask somebody, what, what does that apply to? It, it, well, but let me just give you this example, okay? Luke 13, verse number 20. Somebody pointed this out to me. So, you know what? That's how this works. But it says, Again, he said, because this is after the mustard seed and after other instruction, To what shall I liken the kingdom of God? Again, don't equate the kingdom of God with the millennium. The millennium is a period of time within the kingdom of God, but it's not the same. We're not, we're talking, we're not talking equal uh, terms. To what shall I like in the kingdom of God? It's like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. Well, think about that. That's really interesting because until I understood that there were three festivals that talked about three times when God is receiving a harvest from, from the increase of the land, if you have the leaven of God's word and his spirit, and you put it into three measures of meal, basically bit by bit, then you will reach the point where all three measures are leavened. Well, I said, you know what? I think maybe that means more to me than it used to. The three measures, I can't say, well, that's absolutely the bottom line and there's no more, but God starts with one measure and it's leavened. Then he goes to another measure and it is leavened. And then he goes to a final measure, and then it is leavened as well. Well, I, I believe that's actually part of God's plan laid out in his appointed times. So another reason why I wanted to share the update on, on the chart, because Michelle had made a comment to me. She said, make sure in the context of focusing on the three festivals that you don't give the impression somehow that the other ones don't have the count or they're not the same or they don't weigh because they do. They're all appointed times. They're all part of the process. But I wanted to show that I'm working and we are trying to put all of it down to the degree we understand. But what's new to me is the three times a year in a more specific application. So I think there are three stages of development in God's plan of salvation portrayed by the harvest. And I want to address some of that today. Now, I'm only addressing things that I think we haven't addressed because I don't want to go back and go through all the material that we go through on Pentecost or all the material we go through in the Days of Unleavened Bread. But I want to say, if I try to figure, okay, where can I look in the Bible and find an example that will help illustrate the first of the three times, the barley harvest, instead of thinking just in Days of Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, and then Feast of Tabernacles, 
Think in terms of three harvests, okay? So now what do you got? Well, now you have a barley harvest, then you have a wheat harvest, then you have a ingathering, which is the grain, and not the grain, you got the wine, the oil. The, I never did find a term that I felt I could use to specifically delineate that final harvest. Some refer to it as the fruit harvest or the wine or the, the vine harvest. It, it's, it's all the harvest at the end of the year. There's three of those, three different harvests. Now, yes, the barley and the wheat are together in the first fruit harvest. They are, but they're not the same crop. They're not harvested at the same time, right? By creation. And I believe, and this is why I wanted this to put draft over the top of my presentation. I believe they have different things that they represent. I believe the, bar the barley harvest is not just Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ is the only representation where there is a lifted up offering, the omer, during the Days of Unleavened Bread. That is Jesus Christ. So we're not going to in any way walk around that. But the barley harvest goes beyond just Jesus Christ. There are seven days of unleavened bread. And it is an entire harvest of a crop, not just the first part of the crop. And it represents something, I believe, that is different or additional to specifically the wheat harvest alone. And I think where I found that, where it was least helpful to me, is in the book of Ruth. I wouldn't have looked in the book of Ruth for the answer because it didn't dawn on me until I realized that, look, it, it, Ruth's a small book. And every t <laughs> it's so easy to just fly by the book of Ruth. You know what the setting of the book of Ruth is? The barley harvest. And I mean in spades. It's the cutting, it's the, the sheaves, it's the grain, it's the, it's the uh, what do they call uh, leftovers on the side of the field? It's uh, gleanings, okay? And it's all through the book, and it's over, and it's the roasting and the eating, and the, it, it's just filled with the barley harvest. Now, it mentions the wheat harvest one time, and you got to, if she could continue on to stay that long. But that, the story is not the wheat harvest. The story is the barley harvest. So, what's the lesson then, the book of Ruth, that would apply to the barley harvest, which would possibly then help us to better understand why we have three harvests a year and why one of them is during the days of the lamb bread or at least attached to it? So, Ruth 1, verse 1 came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two kids and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife was Naomi, the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. So what tribe are we talking about? We're talking about Jews, Bethlehem, Judah, okay? Now, because we're going to be we're talking about the barley harvest, and I had to give this thing, a little thought and discuss it as well. What's the what's the elevation of the Jordan River Valley? Well, let's just say round numbers a thousand foot below sea level. So it goes from higher than that to lower than that. But let's say you go down the hill, you're talking below sea level a thousand feet. And when they looked over that, you know, when Abraham and Lot looked over it, it was well watered and green and abundant, okay? At least where they were looking. Okay, well, so now where's Judah, where's Jerusalem in that? Well, okay, now we're 2,500 feet above sea level. When it says go up to Jerusalem, that's what you do. Well, <clears throat> where do you go to get to Bethlehem? You go up to Bethlehem from Jerusalem. Now, not a lot, but you still go up, go up a little further. So you got a couple things in play here that I haven't probably given full credit to. There's a difference between the barley you cultivated and the wild barley, I would expect. These people were actually making, breeding, and developing their crops. You've got a... You know what's on top of Mount Spokane? Snow. Why? It's 6,000 feet. You ski up there. Do you ski at our house during the winter? No, you got some snow, but you don't ski. Why? Because we're at 2,000 feet. 
So go down to Tri-Cities and you're at 700 feet. You know what? There's 10 degrees difference if you drive from Spokane to Kennewick. Just 2,000 feet to 700 feet, temperature will change 10 degrees. I drove it for 20 some years and it was pretty obvious to me. Okay, so you got barley down in the valley, you got barley up on the hill, you got cultivated barley and you got wild barley. So the fact is there is a bigger range of when this is going to come into fruition than I have personally given credit for it, okay? So that's not my expertise, but I, 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 I can't stop and say, okay, there's a range here of time. Everything's not gonna ripen at once. Everything's not gonna be ready by a certain time. Then you got the calendar. And sometimes the year will start close to the equinox and sometimes the year starts later after the equinox up to two, three weeks later, up, could be up to the maximum of a month, I guess. Okay, so the season is from the sun, but the year is from the moon. So the fact is, just because you didn't start the year doesn't mean the sun's not out and the barley isn't ripening or not. So there's more factors here. And I, that came to mind as I read the book of Ruth, because they're in a barley harvest. You know what's not in the book? The holy days are not in this book. And it doesn't say anything about the observances related to the barley in this book. So if you're going to attach that to the story, that's going to be your interpretation. And I'm not going to do that today. I'm simply going to show the story. It's, it's the story that's here. So anyway, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. She was left and her two sons. They took wives of the women of Moab, the name of one was Orpha, the name of the other Ruth. They dwelt there about 10 years. Both Malon and Chilion also died. The woman survived her two sons and her husband. <clears throat> Where's Moab? Moab is on the east side of the Jordan, up above the valley, generally speaking. And they opposed Israel as they were leaving Egypt. They're actually brother nations. Moab descending from Lot, not from Abraham. Lot was Abraham's nephew, but Moab descending from Lot. So they're actually brother nations, but they were an enemy nation as Israel came out of captivity and God said, don't have anything to do with those people. You don't intermarry with those people. You, God did not want Israel to be affected by the idolatry and the pagan practices of these people who had opposed them as he was setting them free. So that's a little bit of the setting, but then Chapter 122, I'm going to skip over some of the context. I will come back to it. So they come back to the land where Naomi had come from. It says, so Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now it was the beginning of the barley harvest in Bethlehem, okay? doesn't mean it was the beginning of the barley harvest down in the Jordan Valley or at another place in the land. So it's a specific setting. And it doesn't connect that to the, to the holy days or to, to Jerusalem. It, it's not there. It's Jerusalem, think about that. Who, who occupied Jerusalem in this story? Well, the Jebusites. There was no Jerusalem yet conquered by David as part of the kingdom. So they were still in occupation. Bethlehem was obviously uh, Judah's territory. So if you then, what, what's the result of, of, of this? Matthew 1, I'm going to come back to Ruth, but Matthew 1 and verse number 2. Here's the Matthew 1. Verse number two, this is the lineage to Jesus Christ. It says, Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah and his brothers, Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar, Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, Ram begot Aminadab, and Aminadab begot Nashon, Nashon begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab, Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Obed begot 
Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. So now that gives you kind of a time frame. So if round numbers, about as round a number as 1,000 feet for the Jordan River Valley would be, David lived 1,000 BC. So you're going back now a couple of generations prior to that, and you're in the time of Ruth. So we're not that far back. I don't know, somewhere between one to 200 years, maybe 150 years, I don't know, whatever it was, you're, you're going back. David was the, the youngest of his brothers, so he's the last one in time that came down. So some of that played out. Now, the, the very famous part of Ruth, and this is her example, and Naomi's telling the daughters to go back that she can't bear more children, they can't grow up and remarry them and bear them children, it's too late, she's old, she's bitter, she's going home, go back to your people. Go back to your paganism, go back to your family and your personal relationships. Uh, the God of Israel is over here, but this is where you grew up and these are where your family is. And here's what verse 15 of chapter 1. She said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Okay, that, that's part of the story here. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, and treat me not to leave you or turn back from following after you. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. This is part of the meaning of the days of unleavened bread symbolized by the barley harvest. It's not an accident that this is a story told in the barley harvest and the example that Ruth has set. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. And Yehovah do so to me and more also, if anything, but death parts you and me. So it's a remarkable, what is Ruth an example of? She's an example of faithfulness and purity. What are those who are unleavened supposed to be an example of? Faithfulness and purity. Is everyone in the church, in the Bible, in the ecclesia, portrayed as being faithful and pure? Well, then why do we think that they somehow are all unleavened, and yet they're not faithful and pure? How can you mix the two metaphors? I think sometimes we just haven't really stopped and considered. The barley harvest is a separate harvest from the wheat. It's part of the entire first fruit process. Pentecost is the feast of harvest. Okay, so the feast of first fruits. That's not the a problem. But the barley harvest represents, Ruth actually represents the barley harvest in type, in symbol, in purity. So just because you're part of the harvest doesn't mean you're faithful and pure. You know what? You might have to be tested and proven before you're faithful and pure. You might even have to die and give your life before you are proven faithful and pure. So again, put your draft over my notes here. The barley that represented Jesus Christ was an omer of grain that was lifted up whole. The grain that was representing the church, the ecclesia in Pentecost was actually baked into loaves and lifted up leavened. The barley was unleavened and was baked and it was ground and processed and then it was ready to be lifted up to God. I don't think that's I don't think that's an accident. I know there's many other factors here that could be factored in, but let's let's go a little further. Ruth number chapter two, verse she goes out and she begins to work in the field. Uh, and verse number ten, Boaz had showed her great favor that he would protect her out in his fields and his people. And she fell on her face, verse 10, chapter 2, bowed down to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? 
And Boaz answered and said, It has been fully reported to me all that you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and your mother, the land of your birth. You've come to a people you did not know before. Did we not do that? Today is Christmas Day. I remember the first time I went home on Christmas Day to see my parents after I had started attending Ambassador College. Uh, let's just say it didn't go real well. It didn't go real well. I was quite upset. And finally, I took my mother aside into the kitchen and I told her, if you ever do this to me again, you will never see me home on one of these holiday times when I have time off to come. You will not see me again. I will come some other time in the year, but I will not come when I am on these breaks. I just told her straight out. And you know what? She heard me. She, she heard me. So it just says, you've come to a people you didn't know before. Ye Yehovah, repay your work and a full reward be given you by Yehovah, God of Israel, under whose wings you've come for refuge. So we did that. We came under his wings for refuge. We left our people. I don't mean abandoned our families. No, we left our gods and our religion and our beliefs. And we came in, I believe, to be part of the barley harvest. I believe Ruth exemplifies that. So go to the end of the book, Ruth 4, verse number 13. Boaz took Ruth, she became his wife. When he went into her, Yehovah gave her conception, she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be Yehovah, who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Doesn't God say, no matter what you left behind, he'll give you more? Does he not say you'll have more family? You'll have more descendants? That's what the story is here. It says, Naomi took the child, laid him on her bosom, became a nurse to him, and the neighbor woman gave him a name, saying, here is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David, in the lineage then to Jesus Christ. So with the barley harvest, again, I'm not addressing all the things that we've always known or studied or, or taught. I'm just trying to add some elements to it. You have the story of Ruth. It's the barley harvest. So the barley harvest, I believe, represents individuals who, as a harvest, are faithful and pure, and they are part of the early part of those who God has, it's one of the three times a year, one of the three celebrations. So we're celebrating the fact that God raised Jesus Christ and brought him in the air. What did Christ do? He came back down and granted the Holy Spirit. And now by his sacrifice, we're unleavened. Well, then those that are truly unleavened are going to actually be like Ruth, as compared to be like the Pharisees or be like others who, quite frankly, have turned aside. So the Ecclesia, Church of God in our day, would we just do a word association? We say, yeah, like Ruth. Really? Not me. Uh, a lot of people that are sincere, but people that are afraid people that won't read their Bible to see if it's different from what they've been told, people that learn to follow a man as we learned. We learned that. I learned that. I was taught that. I shouldn't have learned that lesson. And the sooner I began to unlearn it, the better, not for having relationships in the Ecclesia, but for having my relationship with my father. So when you then look at the barley harvest, there is also a grain offering, and I'll just refer you to Leviticus 2, describing some of that. And there's a grain offering that's different. But the grain offering is unleavened. 
The loaves in Pentecost are leavened. There's, there's a difference, a difference in the way that was done. And there's also an offering from the first fruits where you roasted the grain and prepared it. Now, that's not my area that I have studied deeply. I really am going to have to learn and ponder. When we get to the Feast of Tabernacles, I do want to point out to you something in the sacrifice that helps, again, portray what event is taking place. And you know what? That was pointed out to me as well. Someone says, hey, Mark, look at this. I don't know. I, way back, there were some things I could see in the Bible completely just from reading it where God the Father was made evident. But the honest answer is almost all the things that I've understood in terms of the meaning, the prophetic implications, the concepts. Somebody said, well, Mark, look at this. And then the light goes on. So that's why I'm trying to address this the way it is. I want to do a little bit of a run-up to Boyd's final presentation. We've already had it on our website. Some people have already listened to it. The point was I didn't want to bring it too soon. I wanted people to digest what was available to them and then decide if they could go for it. You don't have to agree. You don't have to believe this. You know, but this is our argument. And I believe our argument is from Scripture. Is there a difference between one body of the members of the church and another body of the members of the church? I think there is. I'm going to, for sake of the time, I'm going to skip down in my notes. I'm not going to go to Pentecost. I, I had some points I wanted to make. I, I want to go down to Daniel. Well, let me, let me just go to Revelation 3, verse 10. Let me just go there. I, I think I can make my point fairly simply. Revelation 3, verse 10. Okay, this is a group, a specific attitude. I don't believe it is necessarily, uh, let's just say, I do not believe it's an error. I do not believe that at all. But it is one of the attitudes that we need to be aware of and we need to actually consider and frankly reach for ourselves. But it says, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. There is a group of God's people who are faithful and pure. They have maintained themselves faithful and pure, and they haven't turned away. They've persevered, and God says, you know what? You're not going to have to face the tribulation. You know what? There's all kinds of people that are pointed out. Revelation 6, Daniel 12, Revelation 7. These are those who come out of great tribulation. Revelation 12, there is a group of people that are where the earth helps the woman. There's a group of people where Satan goes off to make war with them. I believe those are different harvests. I believe there are people who are barley and there's people who go to sleep or become lethargic or make compromises. And I believe the proving of those individuals is going to be the tribulation in the very end. So, Hebrews 11. There are people in Hebrews 11 that were terrible punishments and struggles and persecutions. But there's people in Hebrews 11 who, quite frankly, just died in the faith. I believe Hebrews 11 is the barley harvest. It is not portraying the end time tribulation and trial where they were murdered because they refused to worship the beast. And this goes back to the gospel going out and the angel's warning. The warning is, do not worship the beast. So there's people. The beast has control. The beast is going to have economic control. It's going to have control of everything in your life. It's going to be able to watch you, tell you what you're doing. You can't have money or do exchange if you don't worship the beast. So to be faithful then means you're going to have to stand up at a time when it's not allowed for you to stand up and you will be killed. So there's people going to be killed because they didn't remain faithful and pure in the beginning 
and they have to now prove themselves, and the way they prove themselves is being willing to die. I, I think there's those two groups. Now, we've answered that with the place of safety in the Church of God historically. First you went to Petra, and then we said, well, that's not going to work. Well, then it could be whatever, and then it could be anything, and then it just kept opening up. But let's just say there's a group of people who are protected. I believe they're the barley harvest. And there's a group of people who have to be fired and offered up to God then in, in that way. And I believe that's the wheat harvest. And I understand that they're all first fruits. I don't understand all those connections. I would like to be like going back to Terry's class back in 1966, where you could sit there and have the instructor say, here's what we think. It's not set in stone. And these are the things we need to try to understand. So in that light is why I'm presenting this the way I do. I want to argue for some of the elements of what Boyd has put forth in his studies, and I want to do some of that here today. But I believe, I believe that barley, even though it's still part of the first fruits, I believe it's the example of Ruth that tells us what being unleavened really is. And to give account that the entire ecclesia is unleavened. Well, unleavened, what is unleavened? Unleavened, you're unleavened by Christ's sacrifice. Well, then you have to live that way. That means you continue that way. That means you stop following a man. You stop punishing and lording it over God's people. You stop lying to them. Boy, I, I don't want to get into it. <laughs> I, I can hear Wilberg now. Mark, just go on. Just go on. Okay. I sat in meetings where there was actually something published that wasn't true. And I raised my hand and said, that's not true. We've had that discussion. And, you know, we need to correct that. And the, who's the problem? I'm the problem. Well, I probably was the problem, but that's another issue. So, there are going to be people who are faithful and true. There are going to be people who compromise and, and become, what can I say, Christ-centered? Uh, that's certainly a compromise. You become Christ-centered. That's not, that's not the answer. And I think it's going to cost people their... They're going to have to go and obey that angel and not worship the beast, and it's going to cost them their life. I, I think that's another part of the same process, but from a different group. So I want to go then down... Time-wise, I've already gone a little more than I imagined here. I want to go to the Feast of Ingathering on my notes, Feast of Tabernacles. And I want to show you something that was pointed out to me in Numbers 29. And what's interesting is, this actually supports the argument that the Feast of Tabernacles includes the resurrection of the nations of the world and their judgment, and it's premillennial. So, Numbers 29, verse number 12. It says, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. You shall keep a feast to Yehovah seven days. You shall present a burnt offering, an offering made by fire as a sweet aroma to Yehovah. Thirteen young bulls. Then it goes rams and lambs, and it goes on down. But the thirteen young bulls is interesting. So that's how you start. On the first day, you offer thirteen young bulls. Verse 17, on the second day, present 12 young bulls. Well, verse 20, on the third day, present 11 bulls. 23, on the fourth day, present 10 bulls. On the fifth day, present 9 bulls. On the sixth day, present 8 bulls. On the seventh day, present 7 bulls. And then that particular description is done. Now, that's a very strange pattern, but it's interesting. If you believe that tabernacles is when God tabernacles with men and men choose to tabernacle with God, it is their time of judgment. That means they're going to come up in a resurrection. And this adds all up, add up all these bulls, and it's 70 sacrifices in reducing numbers. Okay, so what could that possibly maybe be representing? All right? Genesis 10, verse 1. I, I just, I find it hard to believe 
honestly, at this point, that it isn't connected to Genesis 10. So here are the nations descended from Noah, Genesis 10. This is called the table of nations in the vernacular, at least by some. It says, now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the sons were born to them after the flood. So now we're going to have a group of individuals. Look at the very last verse, then verse 32. These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, in their nations. And from these, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. So the number of these sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, are portrayed in Genesis 10 as the numbers of the nations that were divided around the earth after the flood. So when God looks around the earth, how many nations does he see? He sees this number of children. What do you think the number is? Well, how many bulls were there? Well, it's the same. So I actually went, I said, well, you know, I can't hardly trust the fact that somebody says that's what this is. So I actually had to go count every name, underline it, make sure I got it right, because it's written where some are referring to people, some are referring to a son, but it's the same difference. It's another, so you know what? Sons of Japheth, 14. Sons of Ham, 30. Sons of Shem, 26. So what's 14 and 30 and 26? 70. So isn't it amazing? All the nations of the earth before God are 70. He says so. And at the time when you're going to resurrect the nations and give them an opportunity for salvation, what is the number of the sacrifices that are reducing until tabernacles is finished? 70 more. I don't believe that's, well, I was, how many coincidences are there in the Bible? I, it's not. Is it a coincidence that Ruth went back to Bethlehem at the time of the barley harvest with this example of purity and faithfulness, and that's what was represented by what she was doing? No, it's not a, not a coincidence. So I believe, I believe that God's going to raise the nations. We know it's going to be after, you know, when Israel and, and, and Judah are raised, David's going to be their king. Okay, but then the Queen of the South said that, you know, she would, Jesus said she would rise in the same generation as the Jews in his time and condemn them. So the Gentiles are coming up. Well, the Jews in the time of Christ are coming up. Well, you know what? It would appear, and God being an orderly being, he's going to raise 13 nations and then 12 more nations and then 10, 11, then 10, and over time and by the end of the seven days then no more of those particular offerings are offered the, the number is complete so since genesis says what it says and since the portrayal of the same period of time that we're looking at agrees with that in terms of at least one of the symbols i think that's probably the answer again draft but i believe that and I wanted to offer that. I wanted to offer Ruth. And again, I left the middle of the argument out. But Matthew 25, if you go and look at just how it's stated, Matthew 25, 31. Got to stop that. <laughs> I didn't used to ever, ever, ever do that. Somewhere it moved into my genetics and took over. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the holy angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before them, and he'll separate one from another. All the nations. How many nations are there in the Bible? Seventy. Well, then, if he's going to have them all before him and separate them, then they're going to have to have all been raised and all put in process. And what would that picture well, I believe it truly does picture the Feast of Tabernacles. The eighth day follows the Feast of Tabernacles, and you leave your booth, your temporary dwelling. It's over. You now have living water, as I addressed 
this year on the eighth day. And the eighth day is going to, well, there's obviously going to be a thousand year period that ends after a thousand years. Okay, that's in the Bible. But that kingdom and the glory and what God is going to do and his rule is going to go on forever. So the eighth day actually, to me, also pictures eternity. You sanctify the altar, seven days. You begin to offer on the altar, day eight. How long do you do that? You just keep going. There's no, there's no expiration of that until it's over and God says so. Well, the same with the priesthood. How long do you sanctify the priesthood? Seven days. Well, when do they get to go to work? Eighth day. How long do they work? They just keep working. So it just goes on until circumstances no longer exist. So I want to bring back now, because we haven't actually used it for services, but I want Boyd's concluding argument, because he, he spoke very well, I believe, in terms of the symbols and the parameters. And I have to just listen to it with the recognition that there are actually three harvests. And I don't think we know all those answers. I certainly do not. But I would like that discussion to go out beyond this room now. And I would like, if God will give us or allow us, I would like for that understanding to then be able to be received. But it actually confirms what is being taught here as compared to conflicts with it or brings it into question. And so I think it would be a good time that we consider these things. Hello all, it is November the 28th of 2021, and this is the 14th, I can't believe it, installment on the Mystery of the Millennium series. Whenever one looks into the future, invariably, you have to end up, love it or hate it, in the book of revealing God's revelation. This needs to be used with the rest of the Bible in attempt to stitch together the picture that God offers us so that we might see. The mystery of the millennium is actually no different. Many of the prophecies of the Bible relating to the destruction of Satan's system and ultimately of Satan himself are found there. It wouldn't be hard to imagine that he has a problem with our understanding it and his created confusion through the false doctrine of merging the kingdom of God and the millennium into one was done with exactly that in mind. With the recent adjustments to our prescription for our eyesight, I'd like to quickly, if there's such a thing as quickly, address the themes that seem evident there in Revelation in kind of an overview it's often easy to get all confused with all the branches so that we don't see the tree. In Revelation 1, we see that the revealing, although the header in every Bible I've ever seen is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation actually came from the Father and it was given to Christ. It's not the revelation of Christ, though he spoke it. We'll read of that in Revelation 1. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which the God gave him to show his servants. God the Father is the quarterback, and Christ is his servant, and we've spoken about that a lot. We see this confirmed in verse 4, where it says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, Grace to you and peace from him, is a very important phrase to remember, who is and who was and who is to come. That always refers to God the Father, without exception, that I've been able to find. How do we know that? And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ. So again, the phrase him who is and who was and who is to come is a reference to God the Father. We see a reference to Christ, uh, yes, uh, we go on, I mean, my Bible, it shows red letter Bible here in verse 8, I just want to bring that to your attention. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, 
who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That is the Father. I have a red letter Bible that says that's the words of Christ, and it is not. The Almighty is God the Father. Verse 11, we see Christ identified, and his descriptor is somewhat different. It says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, or assemblies, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of one of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man. So we now see what he looks like, Christ, in his glorified state, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about his chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were wool, white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. Does he have the capacity to appear as a human being? Yes, he does. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Don't be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. So this is a revealing of events to us that will occur. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So we get additional information as we read what Christ gives to us. Now, in Revelation 2 and 3, we see Christ's messages to the Ecclesia, that's us, of issues, and how they will be dealt with in their time. We might notice, as we just comb through this in Revelation 2.27, Revelation 2.27, speaking of a promise and a gift to God's Ecclesia, uh, he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like potter's vessels, as I have also re have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do we have an ear to hear? It's a promise to the body. Chapter 4 and 5 of Revelation gives us a glimpse of the control room of the universe, the seat of power for the whole creation, what goes on there, the beings present, etc. It is also the control room of what goes on in the human realm, and it reveals to us things that will happen, God's purpose will be fulfilled, He is God. After reading chapters 4 and 5, we can see how God and his servant operate. And that's very important that we begin to understand, because indeed, as Christ was God's servant, we are called to be servants. In chapter 6, we see who hands out the future, as it were, and we see who the Father felt worthy to open the scroll. And so he does. The narrative in chapter 6 we see who hands out the future. We see Christ doing that. And the narrative in chapter 6 brings us to a time down the road of human history when Satan's leading man down the garden path is going to be dealt with. God begins to take a far more proactive uh, portion in things. And in Revelation 6.12... We have a very valuable marker to show us where we are at in the stream of time. I'd like to read uh, Revelation 6, verses 12 through 16. The sixth seal has been opened. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as the sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. 
and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. The sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place, a lot of real estate being shuffled. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the face of or the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Well, what did they see that caused them to react like that? Because it's pretty clear that they knew the gig was up, and they were into a different time frame entirely. Well, we're given the answer in Matthew 24. And we went through that earlier in the Mount series, so I'm not going to belabor the point. But if you go to Matthew 24, and let's pick it up in verse 21, just as a, a sense of review, pick it up in verse 21. Notice this series of events. For then there will be great tribulation, so the tribulation is upon us, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So it's a time unlike any other time. If anyone says to you, look, here's Christ, or there, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, don't go out. Look, he's in the inner rooms. Don't you believe it? For as the lightning comes from east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Everybody's going to know it. And that's what they're going to see. And that's what's going to cause them to say, like, fall, you know, the rock, fall on us. We're done. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. Exactly like we read in uh, Revelation 6.12, the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man appe will appear in heaven. That's what they're going to see. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with the sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. The same thing exactly is recorded in Mark 13, verses 14 through 27, and also Luke 21, verses 20 through 28. We've been through that before, so we won't redo it. But please, if you feel you want to see that pattern again, it's exactly the same. You go back to the fourth and fifth seal, it's the Great Tribulation. So they all fall in sequence. The whole world will see Christ come, gather the saints, and will realize the gig is up. God is about to get involved, and yes, Christ is also involved, as we read in Revelation 6, 16 through 17. The music is about to play, and folks are going to dance. Since the resurrection has already occurred after Revelation 6.12, the sealing of Israel's 144,000 in Revelation 7, verses 1 through 7, are physical. And they're separate from the 144,000 we see in Revelation 14. They are separate groups. And we can see that, a confirmation of that, in Revelation 9, verse 4. When the fifth trumpet is opened up, in verse 4, the uh, folks that come out of the bottomless pit, that would seem to be demons, they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They're physical human beings that have been sealed by God for protection uh, through or for the uh, trumpet plagues that they are alive and going through. The others have already been resurrected. The saints of God, the early harvest, is over by the time we get to Revelation 7. 
And all those that repent and turn to God from that point on will have their reward at the end of the age, which we've covered before. Here on out, here on out actually, we're looking at events that follow the resurrection of the innumerable multitude and the 144,000 who are spirit beings at this time and then will, you know, live their lives. The, the resurrected ones will see the trumpet plagues and the bowl plagues from heaven. Well, what will they actually be doing while that's all going on? Well, actually, we, heard, we learn of that in Revelation 7, verses 9 through 17. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, tongues, standing before the throne, so they were resurrected spirit beings, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders, and the four living creatures, which we saw in Revelation 4 and 5, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and they worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Well, who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more, nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them, and lead them to living waters, living fountains of waters. And God, the Father, will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So they're in heaven... They're being looked after. They're learning to be servants of God and to deal with being a spirit being. And trained in the roles they will occupy when they come to earth with the Father in Christ. The innumerable multitude came through the Great Tribulation. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Abel, Jacob, the prophets, etc., etc., make up the 144,000. They did not come through the Great Tribulation. The Ecclesia alive today have not yet gone through the Great Tribulation, as the Bible identifies the term. When reading through the trumpet plagues, you might want to take note of bowl light, where only a third of things are effective. And Will Berg pointed that out to me. I'd been looking at it. And it's uh, good that we notice that. In the bowls, it's everything. God keeps turning up the volume to get folks to repent. If we have a quick look at Revelation 8, uh, let's look at verses 8 and 9. It says, the second trumpet, The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, not all of it, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Well, that's plague light. What does the real plague look like? Well, let's look in Revelation 16, verses 3 and 4. Then the second angel poured out his bowl, these are the bowl plagues now, on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living thing in the, every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. So we can see that there's an increasing intensity of correction throughout the entire book of Revelation. And this is a common thread throughout the harvest, as we are coming to understand, and we just need to be aware of that. In the following chapters, we learn of what Satan's system is, some snapshots of the battles that will be fought, events that occur in the angelic realm, and all of Revelation 8 through 20 deal largely with the destruction and the demise of Satan's system of worship, his nations, and ultimately Satan himself. The continued destruction of everything he has built and inspired man to build. 
I can't imagine why he would want to deflect our attention away from that. The teaching that Satan won't be destroyed is completely bogus. In Revelation 20, verse 1, he is given a thousand years to contemplate his behavior and come out of that with some frame of mind towards the Father, who he hates. Well, we see what happens in Revelation 20, Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10. As soon as he's given an opportunity and he's released, what does he turn around and do? He's had a whole thousand years to think about his uh, attitude. Let's read that. Let's just see what he's like. He's incorrigible. When the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet were cast, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I think our Trinitarian translators got carried away. That is not the mind of God to have something suffer forever and ever. They will simply be burnt up. We know enough about God the Father. That's just not how he operates. We can go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, where this ultimate demise of Satan and all that he represents... Uh, happens, and if we read in verse uh, twenty, Matthew twenty-five, verse forty-one, it says, "Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me.' This is Christ speaking. You cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So there's little doubt about where they're going, and we actually learn of that demise of Satan." And I was taught many years ago, I don't know what's still being taught on it, I've been away from it for so long that Satan can't die, he's a spirit being. And I always thought, well, that's a bit bizarre. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. The wages of sin is death. And it doesn't matter what kind of a being you are, that's the rules. So, if we go to Ezekiel 28, and we read verses 17 through 19, we'll see where it actually talks about that. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, speaking of the downfall of this carob. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you. And I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. And it's interesting to contemplate that. There are examples in the scripture uh, where people have been given the capacity to see the spirit realm. And these kings are actually going to look at him. To me, there's only one of two possibilities. You may have other things that you can think of yourself. He's either going to give humans the capacity to see this being, or he's going to make Satan a human being, take his spirit, which is defiled, and give him a physical body so that he can toss him into the lake of fire and simply burn him up. I think that's the more likely um, outcome, but that's just something you'll have to think through yourself and see what makes the most sense to you. We also get a glimpse of that in Isaiah 14. It's funny, you know, we read parts of that in the past, but really didn't uh, look any further into it. But we can read the same type of thing in Isaiah 14, verses 16 through 19. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities? who did not open the house of his prisoners? All of the kings of the nations, all of them, 
sleep in glory, every one in his own house. But you are cast out of your grave like an abominable branch, like the garment of those who are slain, thrust through with a sword, who go down to the stones of the pit, like a corpse trodden underfoot. His destruction and his desolation is assured. Our focus in the Mum series has been to separate out scriptures that were falsely attributed to the millennial status from those that are actually millennial. And this brings us to the final two chapters of Revelation, chapters 21 and 22. Where do they fit on our map? To try and figure that out, we need to go and look at Revelation 20, verse 1, where Satan is put into the bottomless pit. We know that it is sometime after the major battle spoken of in Revelation 19. We're not told how long that happens to be. And we certainly looked at other portions of that in some of the other uh, mum series. Let's read Revelation 21, 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of that dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. When Satan was bound, that was considered to be millennial in, in that it was the kickoff event, but it's not. The thousand-year kickoff is when those who chose correctly passed Revelation 6.12, you know, those who converted after the time of the first resurrection and the resurrection of the innumerable multitude, are given spirit life and join those already ruling with Christ, as we read in Revelation 20, verse 4. And let's just read that again. Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. This is after the first resurrection had occurred who had not worshipped the beast, that was their battle to fight, or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So the millennium then is kicked off when these people join the first folks that were resurrected, and that starts the thousand year period. But are we yet missing something? Indeed there is. In a previous one of the Mum series, I asked the question when reading Isaiah 65, and we should go to Isaiah 65 right now, because it is a massively important uh, scripture. And in there, at the time I remember commenting, well, what's that doing in there? That can't possibly be right. That's not what we teach. And I'll just read verses 17 and 18 for you. For behold, God says, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. Well, no, that... The Bible must be wrong. That, that, that's not what we teach. Because right from there, we go right into the millennium. But this new heavens and new earth has already been created. And if we back up in Revelation, in Isaiah 65 and, and look at verses, say, 13 through 16, we can see the event that we spoke of previously where you have the sorting out of the sheep and the goats, the blessed, the cursed, the tares, and so on. So you have that sorting. Then you have the new heavens and the new earth made. And then you have the millennium. Well, it's got to be the Bible that's wrong. It couldn't possibly be us. 
Uh, well, maybe it is us and the Bible is right. If we go and look at Isaiah 65, verses 1 through 5, we look at God and how he's been watching and how he's been paying attention and he's not a happy guy. Verses 6 through 7, he talks about he's going to deal with it. And he gives the reason why. In verses 9 through 10, 8 through 10, we see he has resurrected those people to deal with them face to face. And then we see the sorting. In verses 11, he gives them an opportunity. Notice verse 12, I'll number you for the sword. You want to forget my holy mountain? I'll number you for the sword. You'll bow down to the slaughter because when I called, they were given an opportunity, you didn't answer. And when I spoke, you did not hear, but you did evil before my eyes. And you chose, you knew to choose, and you chose that in which I do not delight. So then you see in verses 13 through 16, the sorting out of those people. My servants will eat, you'll be hungry. My servants will drink, you'll be thirsty. My servants will rejoice, you'll be ashamed. My servants shall sing for joy, you shall cry for sorrow of heart, and wail for a grief of spirit. On it goes, the sorting, the sifting, the wheat, the tares. Then we go into verse 17, and he's creating a new heavens and a new earth. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, that is problematic, all right. Because that's not what we understood. It shows that the new heavens and the new earth are created before the millennial condition is in place. Can we actually confirm that? Well, it turns out we can. If we go to Revelation 21, and verses 1 and 2, Let's take a look at that and see what that actually says. Revelation 21 and verses 1 and 2. Now I saw a new heaven and new earth, same one we read about in Isaiah 65, for the first heaven and the first earth had, past tense, passed away. The old age was gone. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The new heavens and the new earth are created. Then we see New Jerusalem coming down. That means it happens at the start of the millennium, not at the end of it, which we have historically understood. And it's perfectly in harmony with Isaiah 65. The holy city comes down. Oops! I guess Bullinger, as taught by the churches of God, is simply wrong again. Who will inhabit the new heaven and the new earth? Who will do that? Well, we've touched on that before, but it never hurts to look at it again, because it is consistent in the record of Scripture and we need to actually look at that and consider that. If we go to Malachi 4, Malachi 4, verses 1 through 3, what will we actually find? Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble, and the day which is coming will burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. That will leave them neither root nor branch. So the descendants of the wicked, they're gone. They're done. But to you who fear my name, the blessed of the Lord, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in its wing, in his wings, and you'll go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You will trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this. Well, all of a sudden, the dots are starting to join here. If we go back to Isaiah 65, Isaiah 65 and verse 23, 
we will see exactly the same thing of who it is that's going to enter into the millennial existence. Isaiah 65, 23. Remember, back in verse 17 and 65, we have the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. And then it tells us the condition of physical people in the millennium. And then it tells us who it's going to be. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children. There's physical people in the millennium for trouble. For they shall be, exactly like we read in Malachi 4, the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. The descendants of the cursed of the Lord are toast, and they don't go there. Well, can we see another proof of gain, another reference to this order of sequence? Well, it turns out we absolutely can. If we go to Isaiah 66 and verse 22, we see the same tie-in. God speaking, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I shall make, which I make, shall remain before me, says Jehovah, so shall your descendants and your name remain. The blessed of the Lord in the new heavens and the new earth shall go forth as the physical occupiers of that space. If we go back to Revelation 21 and read verses 1 through 4 again, do we believe this? Do we understand this? Will we believe the scriptures or will we believe the teachings of a man? I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. It was done. It was history. There was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city. The new heavens and the new earth is in place. Then he sees the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he'll be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There will be no more pain for the former things, the old earth and the old heavens. It's gone. Do you believe that? There's a, rebel, a millennial condition here. And it's further described in Revelation 21 verses 22 through 27. So some have asked, well, what's it going to be like in the millennium? Well, looks like we're there. Let's have a look. Revelation 21, verses 22 through 27. My little uh, subtitle, here's the glory of the new Jerusalem. So we saw it coming down after the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty, the Father, and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved, these are physical nations, physical people, shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it, physical beings. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There'll be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into us. There are going to be nations in the millennium. Yep, sure is. But there are, shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Well, you mean the Lamb's Book of Life still has some importance in the millennium? Um, yeah, actually, actually it does. There are physical people in the millennium and the Lamb's book of life is a thing because the earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of God. People will have an opportunity for salvation. And it does say that nobody's going to go into there that's defiled or causes an abomination or lie. So is there still going to be bad guys in the kingdom of God? Yeah, yeah, there sure is. 
Isaiah 65 says they're going to die a hundred years old accursed, but they sure will never set foot in, in New Jerusalem. If we go on to Revelation 22, verses 1 through 6, we get a further descriptor of things here that are actually in the millennium. And he showed me a pure river of water, of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, physical people. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants, and we saw them, Way back in Revelation 7, they're now here. They're in the heavenly Jerusalem that's now on the earth. They'll serve him. They'll see his face. His name will be on their foreheads. They shall, there, there shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Over what? You might want to think that through. We see in the millennium the servants of God working for the Father as his servants. And if we look at Revelation 22, verses 6 through 21, it's a recap, if you will, of humans. If you want to have access to the city, you're going to have to be righteous. If we read... Verse, uh, let's see, let's take it here at verse 12. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. If, if we want to have access into New Jerusalem, or into the Holy Land generally, you're going to have to be righteous. Outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. So the latter half of Revelation 22 is a recap. You know, it, uh, you go back to verse 6, these words are faithful and true. You know what? And the Lord God of his holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things that must shortly come to pass. So we're being shown here how this thing is going to play out, how it's going to work. And most of Revelation 22 is a recap and a restating of the rules that will apply both now and in the millennium. If humans want access to the city, they're going to need to be righteous. I can't imagine why Satan have, would have deceived mankind to think that they, would, they could still, you know, uh, be non-commandment keepers and have a right to the city. Can you? Can we finally see the millennium where it belongs? As the millennium cannot start until the harvest is completed, neither can it start until the new heavens and the new earth is in place. Let's put that on our map. We have a place for Revelation 21, verses 1 and 2.